What's we'll make, wait uh, two minutes. Please. You're on. Well, I'll be speaking about partial factorization of generalized products binomial coefficients. And so there'll be four topics. Uh, central binomial products is a review. I gave a talk in this subject last year that covered parts, some parts of one, two, and three. So, um, and then the new stuff is part four. Many slides. So to begin, I remind you about famous stuff about central binomial coefficients, which I will take to be 2n choose n. So um, Paul Erdős, in one of his very first papers, um, used the central binomial coefficients as a slick way to prove Bertrand's postulate that there's a prime between n and 2n for every n, and he obtained Chebyshev type bounds on the pi of x by this method. And what I'd like to do first is to tell you how to connect the factorizations of 2n choose n with the Riemann hypothesis in terms of factorizations of part of them. Um, so you let's write the prime factorization of 2n choose n as p raised to the new p of, of, of the number, the number of um, the number of divisors of p. And for primes that are between a half n and n, we get, it, we get exactly one factor of p because that factor appears in the numerator 2n factorial and not in any of the denominators. And that's, that's a device that, that uh, started Erdős's argument. But for this, for this point, to relate it to the Riemann hypothesis, uh, let's recall that the prime number theorem can, um, can be written in the form, the product of p's up to n are asymptotic to e to the n. And if, if you take the logarithm of that, you'll get the lambda n on the left side and you'll get the sum of the lambda n is equal to n, uh, ignoring the prime powers. Um, and in a similar fashion, the Riemann hypothesis bound for, for lambda of n essentially is equivalent to the product of p's being e to the n with a, with a square root error, and n, n to the one half plus epsilon. Okay, applying that with, uh, by, by, by differencing, if we apply that from the, the primes up to 2n, we will get an e to the 2n. And if we cancel out the primes up to n, we will divide out an e to the n. So we'll get the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the product of the primes from n to 2n being e to the n with a square root error. On the other hand, we know exactly how big 2n choose n is. It, it grows like four to the n, and the and the the, the uh, little square to two pi n you divide out by is an O of log n term. Um, so therefore, we can write the the product of the contribution to two n choose n from the primes less than or equal to n. Well, it'll be equal to the, the two n choose n divided by removing all the prime effect of the primes bigger. And, and, and now we get its asymptotics exactly. It's, it's four over e to the n plus O of n to the one half plus epsilon would be, would encode the Riemann hypothesis. So you can encode the Riemann hypothesis exactly in terms of a partial factorization of two n choose n, where you only consider the contribution of the primes less than or equal to n. And that's one motivation for uh, what I will discuss. So, that, so we, can, we can more generally, we can look at partial factorization of central binomials where we take the product of the contribution of all primes up to some scale alpha all the primes up to alpha 
well, from M, if you're up to alpha times N, um, and that scaling parameter can vary between zero and one. And this talk is going to dis discuss stuff about the size of the par of the of these partial factorizations in terms of the parameter alpha for this binomial product and for various other products. Um, so what what you can easily show for the binomial product is that the logarithm of this product is asymptotic to a certain function of alpha times m as you let m go to infinity. And I, and I will call this, this, um, this function f sub b c of alpha. It's a limit scaling function. It's a scaling function and we're taking the limit as m goes to infinity. And what we know initially is that this function is zero at zero. And at the top end, it takes the value log two. Um, not, not log four because I have that M equals two N in there. Um, so, it, um, and, and, and um, the next slide will show you the, the plot of the limit scaling function. It is, it is the blue line in this graph. So at the, at the top end point, the value of the function is log two and the the error between that and the main term um, is, is very small. It's, it's smaller than the Riemann hypothesis bound. And then it goes down with slope one. And then at the point 0 0.5, you see a kink in the curve. And that's, that's, that's the point alpha equals a half. And that's, that's the point in which the Riemann hypothesis is encoded if, if the actual values are very close to that point. So they, Riemann hypothesis has to do with how close at a given m you're approximating this curve. The, the fact that the limit exists is on, on, the, on the level of the prime number theorem. So here are some remarks in that limit scaling function. So it's a continuous piecewise linear function and it has slope one between um, rationals with uh, one over two K and one over two K minus one and it's got slope zero between one over two K plus one and, and one over two K. So it alternates between having slope zero or one. And that alternation is encoding a behavior of this function as, as a, as, in terms of the inverse parameter alpha, it's, it's encoding a floor function identity there. That the, the, the floor of two X minus two times the floor of X is encoding the top and bottom of the binomial uh, coefficient. And so this computation we did earlier at the, did something at the value alpha equals a half. It showed that log of b of m half n is, is a constant log four over e, one half log four over e times m. Um, and so that, that gives you the value at a half is, is log two minus a half, um, where, where that first kink was. Um, and the Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to a close approximation at that point. Okay, the second thing I wanna talk about is, is work I, I did with Harsh Mehta who finished his PhD at South Carolina last year. Um, it studies the product of binomial coefficients in the nth rows of Pascal's triangle. So here are the products of the binomial coefficients on the nth row um, for, for small values. You notice the odd ones are perfect squares. Um, and you'll observe if you look at a particular, the, these are going to grow very smoothly, but the, the way the primes divide them is going to oscillate up and down. So if you'll look at the contribution of two, some of these things are relatively prime to two and other ones have a high power of two in them, like G8. Um, so there, there are two ways to study this, the asymptotics of this thing. One way is to just take the logarithm and write it as factorials and use Sterling's formula. Then you'll get a nice asymptotic. It's a one, one half n squared plus a square root error. Oh, oh, the square one half n log n. On the other hand, you can look at it from the non-Archimedean viewpoint and, and factorize it. And then the log is written as log P times the contribution of the various factors. And th this way is a mess. That's why people have not particularly looked at it. Um, but 
as is well known, there's, there are formulas for powers of P dividing binomial coefficients uh, due to Kummer when uh, having to do with uh, adding the top and bottom in, in base P and looking at the number of carries. Anyway, you can unwind that and find out what it says for nu sub P of these product of binomial coefficients. And, and you will get that it, it is written in terms of the base P expansions of the numbers. It's two over P minus one times a function. That's the first symmetric function, the sum of the base P digits of the numbers from one to N, and then minus a heavy weight to the very one you're looking at, n minus one over p minus one times uh, the sum of the digits of n itself. In this decomposition, the, the right-hand side is an integer because it's nu sub p of g sub n, but the two pieces there are not necessarily integers. They can have denominators dividing p minus one. And this does happen. Um, So here's, here's a picture just looking at nu sub two of G of N as you vary N. And, and the point is it, 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 uh, it has a lot of internal structure, but it's, it's quite variable. So it, in this splitting into two terms, it's a difference of two terms, the term the running sum minus the individual sums. And, and in a sense, the, the, the main term is, the first term is twice as large as the second term on average. Well, that's, what you would expect as n goes to infinity uh, on average. Um, but we will use this formula to estimate log g of n by splitting it into two pieces that correspond to the two pieces of that base p decomposition. The, the first piece will be the, the average, of the, we'll, we'll take a weighted version of the running sum and then it will subtract off a more heavily weighted piece of the, p, of the base p digits of n itself. And, and these statistics are averaging, they, they fix in and then they average over the, the, the radix bases. So you're some, looking at the expansions to different bases, which is, doesn't look very tractable. Uh, but um, one can actually get hold of the asymptotics of these things for these two pieces separately. Uh, and in these asymptotics, there appears Euler's constant. So the asymptotics, but the, these terms for the for the p-adic expand for the base p expansions, they are the same size as the main term of the thing we are trying to estimate. They they have an n squared. They don't have a larger term. Uh, the the individual factorials that go in would would put an extra log in there, and it's it's been canceled out in computing the an and bn. And you, you can get this unconditionally it, and conditionally on the Riemann hypothesis, you could get a power savings, which, which saves a factor of n to the one quarter, where, where the main term is n squared. So the, it's saving about the eighth root of the main term. And um, maybe we didn't optimize that. Maybe you can save more there. Um, but I, I wanna say that the one key idea of the proof method for this result, which is the the beginning of everything is that it suffices to estimate the B of N, which is simply the weighted sum of the p adic digits, because you can get the, the asymptotics for A sub N for free because you have a relation that log G N is equal to A N minus B N, and log G N has a, has a nice asymptotics from Sterling's formula. So if you know two of the terms, you get the third term. And the, and, the, and the key reason why you can get a good estimate for B sub N is the fact that when you're looking at the base P expansions of the large primes between the square root of P and N, between N and the square root of N, those base P expansions of N have exactly two digits. So the base P expansions are short, and then you can collect them according to the, the value of the, of the leading digit k, and that will correspond to p being in the interval between n over k plus one and n over k, which explains why you get these breakpoints at n over k for an integer k in these things. And once you're on that interval, you can then average over all the primes in the interval. 
and, and, and then you can use standard prime counting statistics to compute these averages. But that's why you can solve this problem. Well, we will bootstrap that. And now we will look at partial factorizations. So the partial factorizations are just the same as the factorizations we had before in terms of these, of these radix expansion statistics, except that we aren't going to go all the way up to n. We are going to go up to some bound alpha times n. So we'll just define a, a, an integer. So these, these are integer sequences, g, n, x, because the exponent of each prime is an integer. Um, so you can, you can take the logarithm of that expression, and you'll get a similar decomposition into two radix sums, a, n, x, and b, n, x. And then we will try to go ahead and we will estimate these two things separately and see what we get as a function of alpha. So the, the, we're trying to get hold of the limit scaling functions. And again, you would like, like to know what you need to say, how close the, uh, the actual statistics approach those limit scaling functions as you let n go to infinity. Um, there is an extra wrinkle here, which is when, when the value x was equal to n, we had a precise answer for what log g of n was using Sterling's formula. But if for the other values of x, we don't have that. And in particular, the value at the middle point was related to the Riemann hypothesis of the last example. So you're not, you're just not gonna have it. Uh, but here's the answer. So there's, there's an answer for a of, a of a alpha n, b of alpha n, and then you use that to get the answer for the statistic you want, which is this uh, g of n comma alpha n. And there's a limit scaling function in each of the three cases. And, and for A alpha n, it's the following mess. Three halves minus Euler's constant, which is the value at alpha equals one. And then it has a quantity which is involving the harmonic numbers at one over alpha, which has been normalized by subtracting off log of one alpha. And then it has a bunch of floor and frac floor, floor functions and polynomials. And that the theorem is un unconditionally it converges to this thing at some rate, and, and conditionally it converges at a at, with a power saving. But what let's see what this scaling function looks like. So here's a plot of this scaling function. So at, at the top end, it's three halves minus Euler's constant. Um, you can't really see what's going on. It looks like it's staying very close to the straight line back down, but actually it's also, it's, it, it, it starts below and crosses above and stays above. And um, it's, it's very close. So here is the scaling function for Bn at x. Um, it's one, one minus Euler's constant, which is the value at one minus this rescaled harmonic series, minus, minus a, a term fl floor of one over alpha times alpha. And again, we have a similar theorem on unconditional and the Riemann hypothesis. So here's what this scaling function looks like. Um, it, it stays above the line from the straight line from one, one minus gamma down to zero for the, for the whole range of the interaction and it's continuous and it is pretty clearly non-differentiable at all the integer points, one half, one third, one quarter, one fifth. But this is the one uh, we wanted to compute, which is the scaling function attached to the partial products, the, the partial factorizations of the of the uh, product of binomial coefficients. I, I, I should say that wh why, why this problem was looked at in the first place is related to looking at the statistics of the products of the Fary fractions from one to n. And if you use very un unreduced fractions where you allow um, fractions that are not in lowest terms, then the product of the unreduced Fary fractions, the inverse of it is actually, the, the reciprocal of it is actually this function g, g bar of n. That, that's why it was studied 
Um, and then the limit scaling function here is simpler in that there, there are only polynomials and floor functions appearing in here, floor, floor functions of one over alpha. The harmonic stuff went away and the value at one is a half. Um, but you get a similar theorem. And here is the plot of what that scaling function looks like. So, that, so this scaling function is much nicer. It, it stays strictly below the line connecting zero to one half, but it hits the line infinitely many points. It hits it at all the points, a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, and so on. And in between, it's a, it's a quadratic polynomial. So it's, it's a piecewise quadratic polynomial in between. So this, this replaced what we saw for the central binomial coefficient where the scaling function lay, lay strictly below the line uh, connecting the top value to the endpoint. So the, these, these points where it hits the line may be of particular interest. Um, It is my opinion that if you if you try to do this thing in a half and you actually had you have the Riemann hypothesis scaling that that actual thing um, would would imply a non-trivial zero free region for the zeta function of a of a finite width. But we we did not uh, examine rigorously proving the opposite direction in, in the paper. Um, about the proof ideas. In this case, we have to get we have to compute both b n x and a n x and b um, b n x is proved by subtracting off b n n, we which we know, and we get the complementary series, and that difference function can, can now be estimated in a similar way using uh, using averaging over the primes and the fact that there are only two base p digits for the primes that are occurring in the interval. And we do not have a and x to start the process at the top, um, but we can use an identity going from the bottom to the top, uh, starting uh, with a and x, and then adding in the stuff about b and x that we are we, we already know. Um, to so the the earlier theorem determining what happens at the endpoint is necessary to begin the process to compute these. So now I want to come to generalize binomial products. Um, so the point of this is that the radix based statistics formulas make sense for all bases and they have exactly the same form. So you, you can define a radix product where you raise every integer B to the exponent allowed by the base P digit expansions. Um, and so, you can just do this by analogy. That will be our definition of GN double bar. And then you can define partial factorizations exactly as I did before. And you can follow a similar program of proof, except that it's much messier. It's, it's nicer because your pro products over all integers, so you don't do averaging over primes. So here's, this thing grows much faster than the previous example. Um, it does show the same behavior. There will be values where a prime is omitted. But in this case, it will only be right at the beginning. So, so two doesn't divide G3, but, but after that, it's gonna divide all. Of them. Um, this is a repetition of the same recipe. Um, and so we have to give the formulas for the asymptotics of these three things. And here is what the scaling function for the A function looks like. It's, it's, it's more complicated. It now has a, a second statistic that's subtracted off that is the, the um, sum of K log K. So the harmonic numbers is a second piece. There's a K, summation of K log K and it has to be normalized by subtracting off a, a square of log one over alpha so that it, it, it uh, will, will converge to something at zero. This is a, this is a proof where you just had to, you had to compute everything and figure it out. There's no way to say what this thing was going to look like in advance. And now here's a closed form that's passed various sanity checks. Um, and here's what it looks like. 
starts at zero and then it's negative. And it does have infinitely many um, non-differentiable little bumps in it that you can't see in the scale. And here is the limit scaling function for B bar of NX. Um, in this scaling function, you see a gamma one, which is the first Stilchi's constant. So gamma is the constant term in the Riemann zeta function at one and its Lorentz expansion. And gamma one is the next coefficient. Um, and, and gamma one is relevant to this J of one alpha minus one half log one over alpha. One of the limit points that goes to this uh, limit point. Um, here's what it looks like. Here's a plot of the, of the scaling function. Um, and again, in this one, the bumps are much clearer, but the, the scale is blown up twice as much. So, um, so then we get our final answer, which is what happens for the asymptotic things of this, of this product where overall integers. Well, since it's overall integers, the main term is, in, in, is increased by a log. So the main term is n squared log n. And there is an, a secondary term of order n squared. And the main thing in all these theorems is that the error term is unconditional and saves the square root. Not, now you might expect unconditional because you have avoided uh, having to do anything with sieving over the primes. And the J of n piece got canceled, but the harmonic number piece is still there. There's still an Euler's constant in the limit at the upper end. The value at the upper end is a one half gamma minus three quarters, which is negative. And the plot of this function, um, well, all I can say is it's, 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 it's strictly decreasing and it's negative over, under the whole range, zero at the starting point. So, so now I'm going to summarize. Um, what's in this proof are the determining the limit scaling functions. These functions are continuous and piecewise smooth on each of the intervals from one over K plus one to one over K. However, the formulas for them are, have, involve discontinuous functions. All those floor functions and harmonic numbers, they're all jumping at all of these points, one over K, one over K plus one. And the jumps have to coalesce so that you get a continued function, continuous function. And they are not differentiable at each of these points. Um, the slopes change and the, and in this, in this derivation, the scaling function for the main term is exactly the same as the three scaling functions in the earlier case of binomial coefficients, um, products of binomial coefficients. You're, they're produced by an averaging, but you're, you're averaging over all B instead of just the primes. And it doesn't change the main term, but you do get new secondary terms. Um, and once you get past the secondary terms, then you get a, then you get a big power savings. And I, I think the, the, the relevant thing that we can extract is that the, in the, the secondary terms are non-positive. Um, and as I said, we're getting power savings remainder terms, then they're unconditional. Um, in the case of the binomial products, we got a power savings term in terms of an eighth root of unity. The interest in this is it says if you if you're looking at the Riemann hypothesis, you it's sufficient with these a of n x and b of n x to actually show that they they differ by a sharp they have a, there's a sharp threshold between the two functions they you the difference between them is a power savings that that would be enough for you to get somewhere. Um, another thing I'd like to say is the title is generalized binomial products. It was not binomial general pro generalized products. Um, it, we, they were not described as a product of generalized binomial coefficients, but you could reverse engineer. And indeed there are generalized binomial coefficients and, they, and, and we are currently studying them. Um, in terms of the research, you might say that this work went backwards by going from products over primes to products over radix bases. Um, they, 
the one motivation for this is the fact that the, from the radix viewpoint, the prime bases are not special. So you can simply ask what happens for when, when you put the product over all radix bases. But the other thing that's interesting is that in the original problem, the, the, the primes were not special, but on the left-hand side, you had very smooth products of things. You had, product, you had products of binomial coefficients. In fact, you built out of factorials in a nice leg. So what are these things built out of? Well, uh, we, we hope to find out. Okay. So here are references. The, the paper with Meta was at IJNT in 2016. The, the paper with Laura Du on the binomial products is on the archive. It will appear in IJNT. And the paper this talk was based on is in preparation. Um, all the, all the proofs are written down, but the um, it, it will be posted in a little while in due course. Um, here, are, uh, here are my credits um, for support, and I, I thank Harry Richmond for supplying these figures. Thank you very much. Um, I just noticed that there was a question in the Q&A, um, okay. but I'm not sure it will make since so long after it was posed. But maybe if Kevin is there, he can ask you directly. What was the question? I, I can't see the Q&A. Oh, yeah, um, I was asking you to repeat the definition of BMX, but I was able to extrapolate backwards from the middle of the talk to uh, remember the beginning by analogy with your other functions. Yeah, I, I repeated this slide with the various BNXs several times. I hope that was. OK, uh, Jeff, thank you very much. We have a uh, little break.